Hello and welcome to our lecture today on rational rereadings, uh, where we're going to be looking predominantly at psychology and sociology of religion and thinking about what, what a term called reductivism. So with reductivism, we have a certain wondering of what happens when religion doesn't work. So religion is based on revelation and revelation as it's recorded is not repeatable. I mean, I cannot go and have the experience that uh, Moses had on the mountaintop. Um, and also um, that revelation might not be compelling. It might not really appeal to me. So we generally tend to think that religion has an outcome and that outcome is stuff like enlightenment, salvation, or an emotional connection to God, the divine, or some sort of higher state of being or higher power. The techniques of religion are supposed to cause an effect, namely, at the very least, feeling a connection to God. But what happens when it doesn't cause the effects that it says it's supposed to have? Here are some problems. What, what if, like, for instance, in Buddhism and Hinduism, you were to ask a teacher, and one Buddhist teacher was asked, how many people have ever been enlightened? And he's like, the Buddha and about 60 other people. And they're like, well, you mean like right, right around on earth now? He's like, no, 60 people in all of time. Well, that's a lot of awful, lot of people practicing Hinduism and Buddhism. If only 60 people grand total in the history of the world were enlightened. So maybe nobody really even gets enlightened. Maybe enlightenment isn't even possible. I mean, I've never met someone who's enlightened and I've been around a bit. Or as Jainism argues, it's we live in a time of degeneration, what they call the Kali Yuga, the era that's right before the end of the world. Well, in this time, maybe nobody gets liberated. The last person to get liberated was Mahavir. And when he died, we entered the next realm in which nobody else would be enlightened. Or what about original sin? I mean, the notion that we have the original sin, which is uh, the sin of knowledge when Adam and Eve eat the fruit of the tree. Well, what if original sin can't be fixed? God says it's fixed in the Bible, but what if the Bible's wrong? What if original sin is so profound that man can never become redeemed or never become saved? Or we can even think about the elect. <clears throat> now in Calvinism, there's the notion of you can be, you are born of the elect or not of the elect. God knows you're predestined whether you're gonna go to heaven or not. Well, what if you're just not of the elect? What's the point of even practicing religion? What's the point of even being a Protestant Christian? What's the point of even being good if you're never going to heaven anyway? Now, no one can know if they're the elect or not, but that does throw a little bit of a monkey wrench in being a religious human being. Um, and even the Buddhists have a notion of these people called, um, <clears throat> they call the Ajivakas, um, who are in the Charanakas, who believe that, who, who are people that are just never gonna become liberated. No matter what, they're never gonna be liberated. And the question is, what do you do with those people? Um, <clears throat> maybe you've asked God into your heart, as the good Protestant Christians always say, or you're initiated into a religious group, or maybe you take a vow, but you have no inter interior change. You get no feeling out of it. You know, you go through the process of professing your love and faith and turning your life over to God, but you don't feel anything. You don't feel anything. Maybe even humanity has not, cannot, and will not develop technology that will create liberation. We'll never figure out a technique that gets us to be saved. Or how about this? Maybe enlightenment or Gnostic union with Christ or feeling the love of God is always temporary. You're only ever gonna feel it a few times in your life. So what do you do when religion fails? What, what do you think of religion then? What if we start thinking about religion as something that's not real and we start asking, well, then what is it? If it's not about revelation and it's not about a connection to God, well, then what's it about? Well, I mean, as a caveat, these are all that I've described have been teleological. They've had a specific end. They would argue that you do religion to have a certain result. Well, maybe religion doesn't have a result. Maybe religion is not teleological. Maybe it is about process and not the result. It's about living as a good monk and living a good life, not becoming enlightened like Buddha. So um, there are many reasons to reject the effectiveness of religion. Uh, for some people, they're just not wired for religion. Religion isn't compelling to them. So what do you do? Do you decide that that person who just doesn't, they're just, eh, religion, doesn't do anything for me. Are they destined to go to hell? Are they destined to be reborn forever? Are they destined to be miserable forever? I mean, what are you, you going to do with that question? Um, scholars, in fact, might proceed forward to analyzing religion without believing in religion 
or they might actively avoid making any type of truth claims about religion. In fact, that's what most of us scholars do, is we're, we don't talk about the truth or falseness or effectiveness or ineffectiveness of religion. We just look about the circulating manifestations of religion in human consciousness and culture. Well, we do have a thing called reductivism. And when I talk about a reductive interpretation of religion, this is what I mean. In a reductive interpretation of religion, there would be no gap, in the words of Jeffrey Kripal, between natural processes and religion or religious experience. Religion, in fact, is a natural or social project. Reductive interpretations or rational rereadings leave out revelation. Religion is about natural, social, and biological processes. Legitimate experiences or the, uh, of gods or gods legitimately existing or God legitimately existing, this is not considered. It's not really a part of what you're looking at. Religion is always about something else. So you wouldn't say religion is about faith. You'd say religion is about, um, is about religion is about social control for instance, and we'll, we'll go on and talk more about this. So um, when I was saying religion is about something else, I mean that like sort of theology works to connect reason and revelation. In reductivism, we reject revelation and we solely use religion. We emphasize religion and discount revelation. So we'll talk about the history of somebody understanding uh, a revelation, uh, revelation event, but we're never going to posit revelation is true. We would say, oh, what is revelation? Revelation is, um, is a mystic experience due to people being crazy or having abnormal frontal lobes. Or an argument I used to make when I was more of an angry, uh, when I was more of an angry atheist, I would talk to Christians, I'd say, how do you know the book of Revelation is a, blue, is a blueprint for how the world is going to end and Christ is gonna return? they just give me details. They wouldn't say how, and i said, say, what? John gets out on the, the you know, this, Prophet John gets his butt out on an island, on an island, eats some moldy bread, has a hallucinatory vision. You write it down, and or he writes it down, and then it gets spread over the world as a blueprint for what's going to happen. So, I mean, that that's a very reductivist argument. Mystical experiences are about someone um, ingesting a hallucinogen of some form. <clears throat> so, uh, yes. So, reductivist arguments. Um, Reductivist arguments include religion is like working out a family drama. So your God is about having a strict father and wanting a relationship with your father. Freud argues this. Religion is the instantiation of societal themes. Durkheim will argue this. Religion is just wish fulfillment. Freud again. Religion is about maintaining social inequality. That's what a progressive activist would argue. Religion is about consolidating resources. Marx. Religion is about maintaining the privileges of priests and churches, Marx again. Uh, religion is about social control. I would say Georges Bataille and Michel Foucault would argue such as this. Now, Jeffrey Kripal gets in there and says, with reduction, you have two kind of versions of it in religious study. You have a strong and you have a moderate one. So strong reductivism would argue that religion is nothing but a natural process. Just, it's nothing but this. Religion is nothing but social control by priests. Religion is nothing but the opiate of the people. Um, moderate reductivism, on the other hand, would argue that there, the fundamental truth of religion may or may not exist, but religion is influenced by natural processes, especially the sociological and psychological. And I think Kripal gives a good phrase on this. He calls it the nothing but test. So is religion nothing but this or that. So is religion nothing but um, abnormal psychological conditions? Yes, no, maybe. So the nothing but chest. Um, the, the moderate reductivism and this moderate reductive uh, sort of standpoint is generally the way that the media reports on religion. So if someone is describing a religious experience or a religious thing that a community is doing, let's say you're on the local news and they're describing snake handling Protestants, they're gonna say, well, these people think this, these people think that, these people are saying this, here's a professor who thinks this, well, there you go. They really suspend making any truth claims, but just weigh in and interpret. And this is where a lot of professors are, and I'm definitely very much there, that, moderate reductivist sort of viewpoint. Um, I do want to have one caveat. I would say that uh, people will often accuse folks 
who make sort of sweeping judgments about religion being nothing but this or nothing but that, um, they'll say that they're, in fact, you know, that they don't understand religion. In fact, people who are strong reductionists will study exactly how and why folk come to believe or act on or uh, come to act on or believe sort of false or troubling ideas. Like I have a close friend who studies the religious right and she's been studying sex scandals. So she's not really interested in the truthhood or falsehood of the type of Protestantism and the Republican party and the religious right. She's interested in how those arguments work, how people believe in them, how they maintain them and how it affects the political process. Reductionists are just <clears throat> not necessarily unbelievers per se. It's just that they're not interested in truth or false claims. They're interested in the how and the why. So moving forward into talking about psychology of religion and sociology of religion, these are main approaches to religious studies. So in psychology of religion, you're looking at the individual and you're looking at the internal processes of the individual. And there's Sigmund Freud right there to your right. Love him or lump him, Freud really changed the way we think about the mind, the unconscious, um, <laughs> personal history, the effects of memory. I could do a whole day on Freud, but I just, I'm gonna go over him really, really briefly. Freud argues that religion is an illusion, <laughs> and he has a famous book called The Future of an Illusion. So Freud argues that religion is an illusion based on the family drama. Uh, religion fulfills unresolved family issues. The stern father is the stern monotheistic godfather, father who is God. By contrast, in India, you could think about how a childhood, the, in your childhood experience of a loving mother, you find that you're separated from her via adulthood, and thereby you'd be attracted to worshiping a loving mother goddess. Um, case, a uh, little side note, Jeffrey Kripal is a big time Freudian man. Uh, big time Freudian, and he describes that a couple of times in our textbook. So when we're thinking about sociology, and this is Emil Durkheim, we'll get to him in just a second. <laughs> when you're looking at sociology of religion, you're looking at groups, and you're looking at sort of external institutions and things that are external to the individual and seeing how that shapes the individual and shapes religion. Sociology studies people and groups and how they interact. It studies the structure of society. How does the social world affect individuals in their daily lives? And how do social structures organize the interior lives of individuals? So looking at the psyche or the soul or the mind, psychology of religion. Sociology of religion looks at social institutions, groups of people and how people group each other. So psychology of religions looks to mental and personal processes that condition religion. Sociology of religions examines the ways social structures develop and how those institutions dictate the formation of the self, especially the religious self and religious experience. Now, Emil Durkheim, who lived from 1858 to, to 1917, had a pretty powerful set of arguments. And I go back to Durkheim often because I find really, really, <clears throat> really interesting and really useful. So he argues that Religion is the set of beliefs and practices that hold society together around a common authority, especially religious authority, and the religious authority of lore and mythology, scripture, and religious actors such as priests and, and practitioners. Society is actually, he would argue, not made up of individuals in a group. <clears throat> in fact, individuals are made up of and by society. So in this, there's a critique of the individual. Um, we think of ourselves as individual identities, independent identities that are sort of like souls wandering in the world. But in fact, there is nothing about us that is not mediated by language and society. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I go back to this. I like to often think, and I think, you know, I've, I've always considered myself a thinking thinker. Uh, I consider my very essence to be that sort of voice going in my head. But when I really look at myself and spend time in social examination and in really close examination, I see how much almost everything I do is dictated by my Protestant Christian upbringing and sort of the town and the community I grew up in. Now, as time has passed, I've been involved in other religious communities and, and lived in many other places, but I still go back to that. And I often wonder if it is society that thinks me, not me that thinks about society. 
The question is how much of yourself is yours? I would argue very little. And how much of it is a uh, reflection of the society that you live in? So individuals do not make up society. Society makes up individuals. Who you are is dictated by what you've contacted and the social institutions that you are a part of. So again, we're looking at this notion of um, the society and the individual. Actually, I want to be back here for a second. So like I'd said, we think of ourselves as individuals, but there's nothing that we do that's not mediated by language and society. We think silent thoughts, but we hear communication, and when we express it, it goes into language. In this way, language dictates our thinking, our speech, everything. Um, the individual as singular is a product of monotheistic thought, especially Protestant Christianity. Once again, I think of myself as an individual, just like I think of myself as a soul, a soul who makes a choice to love God who is safe. However, when you think about India, and a lot of scholars have argued about that, the self is not individual. One, one example they give is anytime that if you are an Indian and you're interacting with someone, you are not just yourself, you are your entire family. So one doesn't see themselves as separate from their family. Like we break off from our families in adulthood. Indians don't do that in the same way. So is yourself individual or is yourself collective? It's, it's a different way of thinking. So we're back to Kripal's idea of the individual as two. You are in fact not who you are. You are in fact not this specific individual, this independent individual. We are the relationships and transactions we have with others. In this sense, you are who you know, who you love, and who you hate. This is the human as two redux. It is the individual and society that is the human as two. You are the individual and you are the society at the same time, or the greater version of you is society and the lesser version of you is the individual. This contrasts with our usual thought that I am the individual, but I am also the all expansive soul. Now, society enshrines itself in religion is what Durkheim argues. When examining religion, we need to look at both the surface of religion and the depths of religion. We need to look at the symbol and what is under the symbol. So let's think of it this way. When religious folks look at religious beliefs as being inherent or independent, they are, that's their inherent view. Religion has to be inherent. It has to be independent. And science needs to look at that. And we find that under these symbols and religious beliefs, we find society, societal pressures, and societal institutions. Now, the most primitive form of religion that Durkheim talks about is the totem. So a totem is a symbol, usually an animal symbol, that represents a group of people that they turn into a god. Now, in this sense, when they bow down to the totem, which is usually an animal symbol of the earliest forms, they're actually bowing down to their own society. So <clears throat> when folks bow to a, a totem, they're actually bowing to themselves. So religion here is not about belief or salvation, but collective representations that express collective reality. Now, religion develops over quite a long time and quite a quite many individuals to the point that the individual is lost. Society may consist of many people as individuals, but over time, the ideas of individuals are condensed and society becomes smarter and greater than any one individual. So when we are worshiping a God, we are worshiping the society that has made us as we are. Think about how deities change, in fact. So uh, one great example of this is Jesus. You know, how might these changes in a deity change society? How do we go from Jesus as a Middle Eastern Jewish guy to Jesus as a blonde haired, blue eyed guy? Or Jesus as, goes from a carpenter to Jesus being a Navy SEAL? Um, how do we think about Jesus in the United States that might not line up with, you know, this short, ugly Jewish guy from, you know, the year zero, in fact? Or to take another example from India, you have the image of the Buddha who is peacefully meditating is how you usually see him. Well, in the time of the Tantras, the Buddha starts to be being depicted as like, um, as and, and the Buddha and Buddhas are depicted as like scary dragons with big fangs and holding weapons and whatnot. What does that show? Well, the society at the time that those Buddhas become important is one that's much more warlike. So changes in deities show changes in society, but they also show how much the deity is society, not just a product of society, but is society. 
So if all we think of is Protestant megachurches filled with white people, we're going to have a very blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus. So uh, Durkheim's most important book, which I recommend you all read, is The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. It's pretty great. He also did one of the first systematic studies and sociological studies of suicide. His book is just called Suicide. He's very much the father of modern sociology. So let's move to a more contemporary character who's a sociologist of religion. This is Peter Berger, who lived from 1929 to 2017, and wrote one of my favorite books of all time on the sociology of religion. Peter Berger argues that unlike most animals, we're born incomplete. We don't have instincts fully wired and developed. We have to make a world for ourselves to support our biological needs. These worlds are cultures. It is cultures that support us. So just as beavers build beaver dams, we as humans build cultures. We build religions. Religion is a world building and world transforming force. There's another definition of religion, and one that I find particularly compelling, a world building, world maintaining, maybe even world creating force. Think that through for a second. So how is it that we build these worlds, that we build these religions, that we build these cultures? Now this is a little confusing, but it's worth bearing through. We build a world by three actions, externalization, objectification, and then internalization. And all these, all these actions are dialectic. By dialectic, I mean that they interact with one another to form something new. Like two sides of a coin, like two sides of something come together to create a dime, for instance. So in externalization, we build a culture that is made up of signs, symbols, myth, and rituals. Of course, we build this based on our experience in society and based on society. Remember what Durkheim said. So at that point, our next step, we, we sort of externalize that society. Now, once that's externalized, we put all these sort of interior needs and societal things within us, we put it out there, then we objectify it. All that we created is experience as being real, as being not created by us. That you know, Christianity actually exists. We did not create it, society did not create it. It was an inherent transcendental truth beyond our daily lives. So social structures become real or seemingly real and separate from human creators. I feel that like the way that we in the United States think about democracy and freedom, as if these are eternal ideas that somehow inherently exist and aren't conditioned by how we use them. Um, then actually, when you think about the way our founding fathers are described in the United States, they almost sound like prophets or divinities themselves. Finally, you have internalization where that external world, society, and religion are internalized so it shapes who we are as individuals. In these three steps, that's how one would create a world. Now, religion, according to Berger, is called a sacred canopy. And that sacred canopy goes over all of life and all people to make sense of life. But it also maintains life. He posits that this is similar to the Greek term nomos, which is a sort of order that organizes chaos and defends uh, us and our world and meaning against chaos. The universe under that sacred canopy becomes significant and it is concerned with human beings. However, he argues this canopy can fail. We can experience this very easily by migrating to another country or into another culture or just traveling extensively. We can see that society, cultures, and religions are social constructs and are different all over the place. And that even, and that just like ours is different from theirs, is not inherently existent. So <clears throat> societies and religions are not transcendentally true or given. Uh, Peter Berger's uh, most famous book is not such a surprise. This is an excellent book called The Sacred Canopy. That's the exact version that I read a little while back. It's, uh, well, I read it many years ago, and I reread it again recently. It's very good. Okay, so when we're talking about knowledge, there's a thing called sociology of knowledge. So I was talking about sociology before and sociology of religion, but I'm now going to talk a little more specifically about this idea of, the socio of sociology of knowledge, or how knowledge gets created by and in society. And there are two key terms we're going to go over here, which is Orientalism and post-colonialism. These are big terms in contemporary um, in the contemporary academy in general, and scholarly discourse in the humanities and the social sciences. So in the sociology of knowledge, knowledge is based on the assumptions and the society of the one collecting the data, of the scientist, of the scholar. So what happens is 
when we interpret religion and data, when we make arguments about it, even when we collect religious information, all of that is dictated by our own societal background. So in this, Kripal sets out, again, two really good, I think, definitions. In strong sociology of religion, or sociology of knowledge, in fact, <clears throat> all forms of human knowledge are constructed, including science is constructed by society. Nothing is objective and all has societal, societal conditioning upon it. In moderate sort of uh, sociology of knowledge and religion, all knowledge is moderated by the social. There is a truth beyond the social, but all knowledge can be seen as, as manipulated by the social and by society. So for some figures, the first one I wanted to talk about is Edward Said, who lived from 1935 to 2003, was a phenomenally successful academic who really brings forth this term uh, Orientalism. So what is Orientalism a la Edward Said? Well, the Orient, when he's talking about Orientalism, is the Middle East, though most people who, who look at his work will extend it to Asia as well. So in the Oriental argument or the Oriental assumption, Asia is considered, or the Orient is considered passive, female, and mystical. The West is considered active, male, and rational. And when you start mapping out prior arguments made about East and West, you see this comes up a lot. Um, okay, so Orientalism is also sort of what I would call a knowledge project. Uh, so by the way they depict the East in this way, by depicting the East as passive, female, and active, you're normalizing the West having power over the East because the, pop, because the West is active, male, and rational. Notice how we already think that, oh, those are better things. We might not think of them as female and male, but traditionally we have. So Orient, East, Asia, passive, female, mystic, Western, active, male, rational. If you can keep that in your head, you'll understand really the big problems with Orientalism. So um, traditionally, no, no, no. So Orientalism becomes a tool of the colonial to justify their power. So I'll talk about colonialism in just a second. Now there is a little bit of a trick here, and that's that Orientalists, that's actually an old term, that's someone who's an expert in the Orient or in Asia or in the Middle East. In fact, Indians call me an Orientalist very often. People will be joking around like, ah, you're an Orientalist, and there's nothing bad about that. These are experts who learn to read and translate Asian languages and live that culture. I have two here. To the left is Sir Richard Burton, who did some of the most important early translations of Sanskrit poetry and quite a bit, of, he did the first translation of the Kama Sutra. On the right, we have William Jones, who's an expert in Persian and one of the first Westerners to learn Sanskrit. In the middle is Dirty Dick Burton, um, Richard Burton in disguise. He would dress up as, you know, the, the, where, whatever people he was, he was interacting with and he would learn their languages and study their literatures and translate their literatures. Um, both of them work for the British government. Uh, well, not really the government, but the East India Company. So the uh, company that was running the colonial project. So uh, Edward Said's most famous book is called Orientalism. It really did change the academy and the way we think about uh, much of how we study the East and the Middle East. Uh, it, it's wonderful. Okay, so I've said post-colonial. So first off, what is colonialism? From the 17th to the 20th century, much of the world was occupied and colonized by European nations. The time when mo and this was the time when most of our modern knowledge about pretty much everything was developed. The colonial perspective is found undergirding most of our modern knowledge, not only of culture, but of pretty much everything. So the British actually ended up dividing religion, dividing India up by religion in many ways. They had an idea that the more that Indians thought of themselves as separate, so as long as people thought of themselves as being Muslim or Sikh or Hindu, instead of thinking of themselves as Indian, the more they were divided like that, the easier it would be to rule them. And they were sort of correct in that matter. Um, so because the uh, British saw Indian religions as being very separate in a way that Indians may not have at the time, they would set out censuses. And the census would be like, are you a Hindu? Are you a Sikh? Are you a Muslim? Are you a Jain? And prior to that, those censuses, censuses, people might not have thought of themselves as primarily Hindu first. 
or thought of themselves as Muslims and not Hindus, or as Sikhs and not Hindus. So those censuses did a lot for dividing up India. And then the crazy thing is, as the British divided India more and more with these censuses, they would tell the Indians, you can't be independent. You're so divided by religion, you could never rule yourselves. So haha, -ha, it worked out just fine, sort of. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so we do hear that some, um, so like I, I had also said that Orientalists and folks studying the non-Western world were usually working for the colonial powers. They were working for the British government in one way or another. Um, or the French government in India or in Southeast Asia or the Dutch government throughout uh, Africa. So some post-colonial contemporary thinkers will argue that only native non-colonial people should be able to write about religion. That's hogwash. It's silly. Experts are experts. Anybody can study anything they're really interested in. But you have to learn the languages and the culture. That's what it takes to study a place. I don't hear a lot of people making that argument very much anymore, but 20 years ago, like there were a lot of Indians that were like, what are white people doing studying us? They dominated us for 300 years. I don't want them dominating us anymore, <laughs> which I get it. But on the other hand, you learn the languages, you learn the religion, you learn the culture, you, you go with it, you just do it. Um, what we have to do and is understand that all of us, even someone who is an Indian studying Hinduism uses colonial thinking, whether we are Indian or Western. We have to challenge colonial assumptions in everything that we do. And we have to acknowledge the fact that lots of our earliest translations and our earliest historical documents and whatnot were written by people who were trying to conquer and control these uh, non-Western areas. So my takeaway on this is that an observer's power position or an observer's power position affects his or her scholarship. Orientalist scholarship was in fact used to support the colonial project and keep uh, colonial powers in power over their subjects. Moving on to something completely different, cognitive science and evolutionary psychology. So um, cognitive science and evolutionary psychology, which are not synonymous, and I'll talk about that in a second, use brain-based and evolutionary models to posit that religion operates and derives from brain-based structures and or religion develops to fulfill evolutionary needs. Um, here's an example. We develop a belief in invisible beings because predators are largely unseen until they attack us. So it would make evolutionary sense for us to believe and worry about and be concerned with invisible beings because stuff we can't see is trying to kill us all the time. Overall, they have this kind of argument about the universal human brain. All human beings have the same brains, sort of like having the same computers, but they set out specific and different cultural operating systems. So brain, hardware, culture and religion, software. Cultural contents that correspond to brain needs and brain structures well are going to persist. Those that don't will not. So, Religion is in fact kind of irrational when you think about it. So why is it evolutionarily effective? Why is it evolutionarily effective to believe that a guy came back from the dead and died for our sins? Well, here's a really interesting argument. A normal story isn't compelling. I don't want to tell a story about a guy who said, eh, you're saved, drank tea, took a nap. Now, a story about a guy who died on a cross and came back from the dead, that's kind of compelling. That's a pretty interesting story. So a story has to be sort of interesting. It has to be, to be memorable, to be effective to us. So why do we have stories about people with magic powers founding religions? Because it sounds cool enough that we're gonna to wanna to hear that story again, that'll stick in our heads. They won't just, it won't just flutter away as just another bit of information. A story, however, cannot be too separated from reality or humanity. There are not religions until quite recently about incomprehensible inhuman entities. So, for instance, there, there's a group of occultists that I've been familiar with who have taken the writings of H.P. Lovecraft and started worshiping the old gods in H.P. Lovecraft. Well, I'll tell you what, it's pretty hard to build a religion about Cthulhu, who's completely inhuman, has no care for humanities in, in any way, and just, you know, is beyond time, space, and reason, and looking upon his very face will drive you mad. However, Strange times being what they are, now some people find that compelling and think, oh, maybe I'll worship that God. Hard to say. But my point would be, 
Uh, moderate weirdness selects for survival for culture and for cult cultural transmission. So if you want to start a religion, make sure it's at least moderately weird. So, so this I wanted to add uh, something that Kripal talks about, but I think is a really excellent understanding of how evolution and religion works. And for that, I want to go to the great Stephen Jay Gould, who lived from 1941 to 2002. He was not, uh, he was a biologist and naturalist, study of evolutionary theory, and actually one of the best science writers whom I have ever read. So Stephen Gould argues that religion is like spandrels. And I have a picture of a spandrel over here. A spandrel is a piece of art that is carved into an empty architectural space. It is needless art. The art doesn't need to be there. It doesn't really communicate anything in particular as art, but it sort of fills the space. And since the space is there, an artist is going to put some art there. Um, this is similar to religion. Religion, when we think about all the structures of our brain, doesn't need to be there, but there are these empty spots, like those empty spots in the architecture, that get filled up. And what do they get filled up by? They get filled up by religion. In this sense, religion is decorative, but it does fulfill real needs. Religion may be a spandrel, as Gould argues, but it has real effects. Now, this is Kripal at his best. He's, he's taking a bunch of these arguments together because he wants to make his own type of argument. And you remember that I've critiqued this often. He says that there is human sameness despite religious difference. This is a very Kripaldian move. So he's looking at all these different types of evolutionary psychology and cognitive science to posit his thing. We're all humans, our consciousness is all the same, and might be expressed differently, but we can look at things in a comparative manner to see how consciousness experiences itself. Here's some critiques. Um, evolutionary psychology, I have a lot of problems with. It generally argues that religion is the byproduct of our evolving process as human beings. But evolutionary psychology is not evolutionary biologists. And evolutionary psychologist thinkers are usually pretty lousy in their Darwin. They take some pretty big flights of fancy to justify their psychological theories. In fact, I find that they often use, um, evolu they use their evolutionary ideas to rethink hu human behavior based on a negative or evolutionary ill-founded notion of humanity. They tend to think of humanity as being pretty horrible. So they would argue in evolutionary psychology well, why do, why, do, uh, why do men rape women? Well, they rape women to have children because that causes their genes to be passed on. Well, nonsense. Men don't rape women to have children. I mean, I'm sure some do at some time. It's about power and control and revenge and all of that. So um, in fact, I feel that they go out of their way um, to argue that humanity is cruel, base, and somewhat vile and they say that the reason for that is, evolution, is evolutionary processes. I don't find that consistent or convincing. In cognitive science, it becomes just yet another big argument where we say people do religious stuff because of this stuff in their brain. Now, in fact, my bigger issue is that many scholars turn to cognitive science in order to study religion when they are unable to study religion in the way they want, usually because they are insiders, uh, because they are actually sort of religious believers with their own bend and want to be studying themselves all along. And the study of religion, religious studies, doesn't want to support that. So for an example, religion is not about prayer. Prayer is a part of religion, but it's not all about prayer. But people will study prayer using cognitive data, and then suddenly everything about religion is about data and the function of the mind. This is really true about meditation. So meditation is a big deal in all these you know, Asian religions, but fewer than 10% of the people do meditation. So somebody that gets into cognitive science and meditation is gonna wire people's brains up and look at how their brains work while they're meditating. And the next thing you know, everything about religion is about meditation again, even when we've realized for a while that a lot of people talk about meditation, but very few people actually do. So I want to bring in um, uh, our second to last thinker, who is Anne Taves, who was born in 1952. She's an expert, well, she was kind of an expert in Catholicism, but she's a scholar of American religions who also studies mystical and paranormal experiences. She uses cognitive science, but doesn't use the too much evolutionary psychology. What's her big deal? So unlike the majority of these mental-oriented religious studies thinkers, Taves studies human experiences and how experiences 
create religion. And I was resistant to her, and I know, I know Anne, um, but I've, I've come around on her thinking quite a bit, in fact, um, especially as I've seen this apparatus, I'll explain, so I've seen it used to explain religious phenomenon very effectively. So, one second, let me wet my whistle. Taves argues that sort of singular extreme experiences form religion at large and in individuals, and that these should be studied using cognitive tools. She says that experiences deemed religious are building blocks. So instead of studying traditional religious experiences, those, uh, or she decides that she's not gonna look at what experiences are usually you know, deemed, well, let me say that, let me say this another way. Instead of studying traditional religious experiences, i.e. those experiences that are generally accepted to be religious and correspond to traditional and authoritative religious experiences, Tave studies experiences deemed religious by individuals. So she dodges this, any ideas of normative religion. What she goes to argue is that people have really weird, wild experiences. Then, they go, that experience is religious. Now, a priest might not call it religious, a swami might not call it religious, the pope might not call it religious, but they call it religious, so they move on. Sort of like, for instance, if someone is reading a Bible and they have a vision of something that's very powerful, they see a man get hit by a truck, and then they see a man get hit by a truck the next day. That's a powerful experience. It might not be considered religious in a normal way, but people are going to consider those or deem those to be religious experiences. And she says that those experiences that often overlap with the paranormal and the supernatural, those are the experiences, including people having specific mystic visions, the content of which might not be normal for the religion that they're a part of. They're gonna take those experiences and they're going to use them and they're gonna generalize them. They're gonna go from that experience, let's say, I had this amazing experience, which told me to have more faith in God because that thing came true or faith in my ability to see the future when reading the Bible. And from that, I'm gonna generalize it even farther and say that I know God is in my life and is real because I had this experience that came true when I was reading the Bible. Um, so, <clears throat> genuinely anomalous experiences create religion. This is sort of bottom up instead of top down. We're saying people's experience generate new religious content instead of someone saying this is religion and telling it to someone. Uh, she really focuses on the details of experiences to think about how religions form and change. These experiences can range from the mystical to the prophetic to the, para to the paranormal. Paranormal powers to visions, these are experiences that people have. They deem them religious and then those experiences that they deem religious affect how they think of their own religion. So Taves makes this really powerful statement, and I'm just going to read it to you. While theories of the first type, by which he means evolutionary psychology models that focus on the detections of threats and resources, remember that I was talking about um, we believe in invisible beings because there are tigers that we don't see that are coming to get us. Uh, yes, so while theories of the first type argue that religion is a spandrel or byproduct of evolved capacities with no particular survival benefits, Research on the placebo effect. Now remember the placebo effect is when you take a sugar pill, but you have the effect as if it's real medicine. Or if I tell you that you're psychic and somehow you're able to start being able to, you know, um, you, I tell you that you're psychic and suddenly you have psychic powers. You start having visions of the future that come true. So research on the placebo effect suggests that the attribution of non-ordinary powers to things or to people may trigger capacities that, of, that would be otherwise unavailable to people, thus providing an evolutionary advantage. It's all kind of in there. So the religious experience may not be real, but it will change the individual and can change the culture. And telling someone that they have a power or recognizing their power as they're genuine may cause them to have greater behaviors or abilities or whatnot that might cause them to be more evolutionary successful. A religious experience that is not real may trigger real capabilities in people. And these capabilities may even provide an evolutionary advantage. Now, Tabes is very uh, informed by a guy named Wayne Proudfit, who I'll end with in just a second. So I have a defense of reductionism. I think reductionism is good. Um, I can, you know, 
and, and I like these ducks here. They make me happy. You have, you know, you know, reductionism would say, well, this is how a duck, <laughs> how does a duck work? It, you know, it's an animal. It has all these organs. Or, you know, I could argue that it's all this wild dreamed up structure because ducks are just tiny little machines. Which one is the reductionistic one? I would say the reductionistic one would say, no, they're real organs. You don't need to posit weird mechanical duck entities. Anyway, I find reductionism to free us from the tyranny of experience and theology and even the mystical. We can study religion without having to have religious experiences. We can study religion without thinking it's all about theology. We can study religion and talk about how it's not even about God. So we can just study religion and make claims and even reduce religion to being just about the world and society. I find that very satisfying to say that religion, you know, my people that are really obsessed with a very scary over, um, overbearing white haired God in the sky sitting in judgment are people who are working out their poor relationships with having a very strict and distant father. That works for me. That's a useful explanation. Um, we can study whatever we want without requiring an experience or, um, and we can, we can just make judgments about religion without needing experience. Reductive arguments are satisfying and concrete, even if they miss even if they misreport lived experiences, they're satisfying. So let's close with Wayne Proudfoot, and you can't go wrong with that face right there. Um, Wayne Proudfoot, well, oh, and he was born in 1939, and he's still alive. Uh, so Wayne Proudfoot talks about reductionism in a way that I find really useful, and he gives two steps to it. But before that, I need to kind of explain a little something. So it's never appropriate for a scholar to describe a religious experience or a religious phenomenon in a way that is not recognizable by the person who experienced it or originally described it to him. To understand this, let's think of two things. You have insiders, practitioners of religion, and outsiders, scholars who study. We have these two fancy words, edic and emic, here that are useful. So the edic is the perspective of the outsider and the scholar. The emic is the insider perspective and it is the, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, the, it's the one who's the practitioner and insider. So in this little diagram, you see the edict and the emic insider and outsider. And then the one thing in the middle is reality. You'll hear these terms edict and emic in other classes, I'm sure. All right, so there are two steps to good reduct reductivism and reductionism. And the first step, you describe an experience as closely as possible to the way the experiencer experienced it. You're trying to faithfully report what the experiencer has said and suspend any judgments. You're just trying to get it down exactly as they say it happens. You're capturing the emic or insider perspective. But you can't end there. You can't just report what people say. A scholar has to make an argument. You have to do something with these reports. Um, and this is at the stage, when we're moving to the second stage, that you begin to interpret. In the first stage, you describe without interpretation. In the second stage, the scholar explains the religious experience, like I'd said, and makes an argument to interpret that religious experience. Now, at this point, there's no need for the interpretation to correspond to the informant's perspective. This is edict. This is reductive. This is exactly how I study magic rituals. I don't ever argue that magic rituals are true or false. I really don't care. I think they're false. I try to describe the magic ritual as clearly as possible as the text says it, or as the person tells me how they did it. I try to get that as faithful as possible, and then I'll make an argument, such as we are looking here at, at religious rituals that manipulate social symbolism because people were worried about social tensions. So religious rituals to make people love each other or hate each other shows that people are really anxious about the natural processes of loving and hating and they want to manipulate that in some way. So good reductivism does two things. Describes the religious experience as closely as possible to how the experiencer says it, and then makes some sort of an interpretation afterward, but doesn't change that description. Your interpretation shouldn't be in the description. I think that's really a key point. Um, so in the end, and this is what I'll ask you today, how would you explain a religious phenomenon? Would you say that someone abducted by aliens is working out their, um, their repressed experiences of sexual trauma? Would you say that they are working out uh, feeling a sense of loneliness that they have in this life and wanting to commune with the stars? 
Are they purely hallucinating because they took a drug or are crazy? Are they experiencing one of God's many miracles? How would you explain a religious phenomenon? Would you say it's nothing but somebody being crazy or being high or being drunk? Or would you say it's something more than that? That person would be reductive. A non-reductive would say, oh, it's an experience of the spirit. <laughs> it's, a, it's an experience of, as uh, Whitley Stryber and Jeffrey Kreib will come to argue, of these entities that have been interacting with us since the dawn of time with bright lights, big eyes, and sort of um, odd animal connections, especially with owls. What are you going to argue? So with that, I bid you adieu, and I will see you next time.